Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Okay, so we wake up this morning. Coach K is retiring, which will mean that uh, college basketball will never be the same again. Bibi Netanyahu is out as prime minister, which means that Israeli politics will be different than what we've lived through for the last several decades until at least next week or something. And uh, Donald Trump has shut down his blog after just three Scaramucci's, less than three Scaramucci's. Donald Trump made an interesting move today. He quit his own blog. His blog page from the desk of Donald J. Trump on his own website has been permanently shut down. I know it's a real punch in the gut for me too, but it's, he was very excited about this blog for the first month after he was banned on Twitter. And now he's just abandoning it. It's a move he calls the Eric. And according to, according to one of cold. Just cold. his advisors, they uh, learned that the reason he shut it down is because people in the media have been mocking how few people were visiting his site. Traffic to the website dropped 99% from last year. So from now on, he's just going to write bitchy little notes on the dry erase board at the Mar-a-Lago omelet station. There's, more people will see them. Okay, I, I I I couldn't I just could not resist it. Our, our special guest today is Isaac Dover, who is the author of the new best selling book, uh, "Battle for the Soul: Inside the Democrats' Campaign to Defeat Trump." A staff writer for the Atlantic. Uh, so, Isaac, thanks for joining me. I appreciate it very much. It's so great to be here, Charlie. Thanks for having me. So, what what was your best memory of the Florida man's blog? <laughs> I mean, as we, as we as we look back on this era, this kinder and gentler era. <laughs> Out of the 29 days of the blog, do you have any best memories? It's, uh, I guess it's not a golden age for blogging. Uh, the, 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 Who knew? Uh, the, the, the Washington Post had a stat, uh, I think two weeks ago in an article about it, that it was getting less traffic than Pet Finder. Um, <laughs> but it, it, is, it, it, it is a real uh, statement, I think, of how much Twitter was essential to Trump, right? That the the way that he's been sending out these statements uh, that I get and you probably get in your mm-hmm. inbox uh, from either the former president's office or from the Save America PAC, and it, he is less a part of the conversation doing that. This blog was supposed to be some way of getting back into the conversation. It wasn't working. Uh, and... Uh, you know, it, it just shows that over the two years of the 2016 campaign and the four years of the presidency, that really it was shaping that conversation. I remember there were reports of people watching him in the White House get excited that he could tweet something and then within a few minutes seeing it on cable news and seeing the screenshots and seeing all the reporters responding and all of the other people responding, whether they loved it or hated it. And uh, I guess they need to try to find some other way through with the social media ban uh, continuing, at least for for a while, if not forever. Yeah, but we we were told this was going to be the thing that would revolutionize the internet, and it turned out to be a blog. Okay, so one one more cheap shot, if you don't mind. Um, George P. Bush uh, running for attorney general in Texas, and um, against against another Trump loyalist. But here's my favorite part of the story, and I know that you saw this as well, that Apparently they were hanging they were handing out some swag yesterday this these these koozies which actually have a picture of George P with Trump with the with the quote I'm not making this is not a parody the quote this is the only bush that likes me this is the bush that got it right i like him donald trump so he actually is handing out the swag with donald trump saying this is the only bush so george p is not only sucking up to Donald Trump, so my cringes are cringing, but he's basically ripping his own family members. <laughs> it's sick. I mean, really. Yeah, it's it's really. Uh, it is so the, the the distaste for Trump and the Bush family was so high that um, George H. W. Bush didn't want him to come to the funeral, and right. and then decided that he didn't want that to be the story uh, that it, Trump was not yeah. invited to the funeral because he was mm. the sitting president at that point. Yeah. And H. W. Bush was, uh, as you well know, very much a man of protocol and the way things should be. But he just didn't want that to be that his funeral was swamped by coverage of how Trump wasn't there. And so Trump was invited, but he was the sitting president to not give the eulogy at 
the president mm -hmm. at the funeral of a former president, that's also standard. And that's where H.W. Bush drew the line. Of course, we know all the things that George W. Bush and Jeb Bush uh, said about Trump or <laughs> indicated about Trump along the way. And the way and George P. Bush is Jeb Bush's son. Yes. I mean, Trump literally emasculated Jeb Bush on stage and in every way that he could. Uh, and Jeb Bush uh, fired back. And now George P. Bush wants to uh, get ahead in his political career. It is, you know, it, a, a statement so much in itself that uh, the Bush dynasty now needs to attach itself to Trump. And uh, you've seen the reports that Trump is amused by this. Of course, the attorney general that uh, George P. is running against uh, was very much on board with the election challenges. Uh, Ken Paxton, he's got his own problems legally that are part of this too. But so you've got one person running for attorney general in Texas who uh, went far out of his way to try to back the lies about the election. And you've got another one who is now going far out of his way to connect with the Trump, uh, I don't know what it is, the Trump spirit, uh, even yeah, though it, that is stepping on his family. Yeah, it's a, in a particularly grovelly way. I mean, it's it's not it's not unique that he's doing it. It's just that it's it's rare that you throw your 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 father, your uncle, and your grandfather under the bus all at once on a yeah. on a on a koozie, <laughs> just, <laughs> right? On a on a beer koozie, <laughs> on a beer koozie. Um, yeah, for people, yeah, for people who. I'm sorry, I'm a Wisconsin guy, so I just assume that everybody knows that when I refer to a, a koozie. Okay, so let's talk about the book. I, I, I told you right before we started, there was a lot of other things I wanted to talk about, and then I got into the book and realized, no, I just want to do that, and then I just have to tell people that uh, this book is getting just great reviews and it deserves them. Um, this is from The Guardian. Uh, uh, Devere's first book is informed and granular, filled with uh, up-close quotes and lacerating observations, a must-read for newsrooms and political junkies. It captures Biden's post-2016 uh, ascent and the conflicts within his party. And here's, uh, again, this is from, I believe, um, Decision Desk HQ, which also talks about this, um, you know, the, the dark night of the Democratic uh, soul. He said, look, uh, as an explanation of the nation's top Democrats and the dynamics between them, uh, this book is one of the best volumes I've read, not to mention it is full. It is chock full of delicious dirt. Well, we'll get to the delicious dirt in a while. The main characters in this book, and you correct me, Isaac, um, if you have a different perspective, it strikes me is that this is a, a Trump era book that's not really about Trump. And the main characters are, of course, Joe Biden, but also fascinating portrayal of Barack Obama. So should we start with Barack Obama, who, uh, he, he, number one, apparently was increasing, well, you, you recount in great graphic detail, increasingly alarmed at the prospect of a Trump second term and who Trump had turned out to be, but also someone who at least initially uh, was very, very skeptical about Joe Biden and tended to underrate his political skills. So can you talk to me about uh, Barack Obama's role in this campaign? It, well, the book starts uh, very much on purpose on election night 2016, and it's got these stories about Obama and Biden watching Trump win and trying to process it and trying to think about what it means. And part of the reason why I included those stories is because they're interesting and they've never been reported before, but also because they really reflected what I think a lot of uh, the country was going through and all, uh, certainly a lot of the Democratic Party was going through of at first saying, like, this is just crazy. Nobody thought this would happen. And then slowly. Slowly, in a way that I trace over the early chapters of the book, uh, it, getting real about what it was that went wrong and what all the things were that came together that enabled Trump's election in 2016. Obama, though, like he is a complicated character. Uh, he really is as a person. Uh, and I can say that having with no humble bragging intended here. I was a reporter covering the Obama White House. I've talked to him on the record. I've talked to him off the record. He's a complicated person. One of the things that I think was wrong about the way people saw him over the Trump years is this idea that he was completely detached and didn't care what was happening uh, and was sort of leaving the Democrats to uh, flail in the wind. There was some of that, and he was definitely interested in building up his foundation and building up his own personal wealth and doing things like his Netflix deal. But 
there was a real fear that he had that grew more and more over the Trump presidency. And I think as it happened for a lot of people, uh, that that this knowing what it was to be president and what was there, what was part of it to Obama, this was incredibly, incredibly worrisome to see what this was. And so he looks at Biden at the beginning of the race, as I think nearly everybody did <laughs> and says, Hey, he's a little old. Um, mm -hmm. and he doesn't really connect with crowds. Uh, and he seems not really in a good shape for where the party seems to be headed. How's this going to work for him to win the primary? And then how would that work for him to be the general election candidate as much as I may love him myself. And so wh when I track Obama doing uh, the, the reservations that he had about Biden, the feelings that he had about Trump, and also the work that you see him doing as a former party leader that is so much more extensive than the work that he was doing as the the president himself leading the Democratic Party in his eight years in the White House. It, to me, it was uh, representative and reflective of, of what a, a bigger mood was going on, uh, uh, certainly, again, among Democrats. But I think for given how the election turned out, not just among Democrats. So the, the the two men had such different styles as well. Um, you 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 sort of quote um, Obama as, as thinking that Americans want their presidents to have some swagger, and he was afraid that uh, that Joe Biden would stumble. Biden is better with small groups. He doesn't have that mesmerizing charisma that uh, Barack Obama had speaking to thousands. So there's a there's a very very you know, fundamental difference in their style. So does that go into o Obama underrating uh, Biden's political skills? Yeah, definitely. There, there's a moment that I uh, heard about that Biden, when he is vice president still, he's flying around on Air Force Two at one point, and he says you know, about Obama, he says, I've never seen someone who's better at talking to 10,000 people yeah. than to one, right? And, and to Biden, this is... It's bizarre. He like he loves Obama. He he likes serving with him. He 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 was completely admiring of his style. But Biden's style is that guy who will. And I've seen this happen too. He'll work people in a diner, one voter for twenty minutes. Obama style is the guy who will go to a rally and get ten thousand people cheering. It's so so different. And there's a quote in there from Jen Psaki, who obviously now is Biden's mm -hmm. press secretary, but had been Obama's communications director at the end of his time in the White House. Worked for. Obama. Obama over the years uh, in a bunch of different capacities. At the time she said this to me, she didn't know that she'd be working for Biden, should be said. She said it to me last yeah. summer. But um, she she said it, Obama always underestimated Biden's political skills because they were so different from uh, his own. And that's it, it. I'm not sure one of the questions that is posed towards the end of the book, when you think about how the general election campaign went and how much the pandemic affected things, is what would it have been like if there had been a normal campaign season with rallies and and all the rest of it uh, to compare what Trump would have drawn versus what Biden would have drawn. But uh, it certainly gave Biden an ability to play to his strengths uh, rather than to have some of his weaknesses exposed. Yeah. And, and with the weakness, the other point that, that I took away from from your book um, is, is also that not only do they have very different styles, but that that Biden really has a very different um philosophy about what democrats should do and and had a and, and drew distinctions between his approach and obama's so for, apparently um and and you 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 sat down with 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 joe biden after the election and i want i want i want to talk about that in a moment but one of the 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 questions that he asked you was how many times did you hear us as democrats uh even in parts of our administration talking about the middle class and so he was, you know, watching his fellow Democrats talking about poor people at the expense of society's working middle class. And, and this was something he very self-consciously wanted to do differently in 2020. So can you talk to me a little bit about that? Then I mean, this is middle class Joe. We're not obviously breaking news here, but it's interesting that that he in his mind, he had this critique of a Democratic Party that had lost touch with with its you know, one time constituency. 
I think this is a key point, and it's something that I trace with Obama struggling to do anything to talk about the economy in good shape uh, in, in during his eight years and not knowing how to wrap his hands around the, the question of wage stagnation and people feeling like they were in the real economy the way that they felt it around uh, their kitchen tables, but also paying their mortgages and thinking about student loans and all that stuff, that they could not see how... Uh, things were getting better for them. And in fact, it felt like things were getting worse. And Biden has this sense, and I, there there are two interviews with Biden that uh, that are in the book. One was a week before Trump's inauguration, and I was uh, in his office in the West Wing a couple doors down from uh, the Oval Office. And and the, the second was uh, about two weeks after he is sworn in as president, uh, and he's in the Oval Office at that point. He looks at this and he says, it, it's actually not that complicated to him why Trump won, uh, because hmm. Democrats gave up on the things that they were supposed to be talking about that were the core of the Democratic Party to him. The, the, uh, you think about all those union members who in 2016 felt – uh, that they should vote for Trump or that they should vote for Bernie Sanders, you know, who, as everybody knows, p- pretty different politicians, you'd think, but who are speaking to that same sense of just people getting left behind, right? Not, not feeling like anyone was watching out for them. But in the general election to turn to Trump, Biden says, Democrats stopped talking to those people. And those people then said, OK, well, if you're not talking to us, then we're going to leave and we're going to go and uh, vote for uh, Republicans. We're going to vote for this guy, Trump, who seems angry about it, who seems to at least feel our uh, frustration and passion about what needs to happen here. He's going to fight for us. Uh, and they they turn away from the Democrats in a really, really big way in 16, in a way that the Clinton campaign did not have a handle on, thought that they had some sense of, uh, but really didn't. And I don't know. It's another one of those what ifs. But it, you look at uh, a lot of the other candidates who were running in the primary, uh, th- th- whom Biden beat. I'm not sure that uh, they would have been able to get back the mm-hmm. the n- numbers of voters in the places that they needed uh, that, that Biden did. Uh, but he certainly did pull together that coalition himself. And this is the reality check. And one of the details of your book that I found interesting is sort of the contrast between Joe Biden understanding uh, how, uh, you know, the, the the wrong turn the Democrats had taken there um, in the contrast between that realistic attitude and Eric Holder, the the attorney general who uh, you you portray as being, um, shall we say, uh, irrationally exuberant that that he thought that. Uh, the election of Barack Obama changed everything, that this would be the new Aquarian age, that all things would be would be new and all of the old rules no longer apply. So, so yeah, talk to me about, about Eric Holder thinking that, that all things were new. Uh, what what I think Holder is reflecting is, is not a just naive sense of things, but there was that sense that a lot of Democrats had, and I think that a lot of Americans had, uh, right when Obama won, that this is, it's not just about like racism is over, though some people did believe that. Um, but it was a sense of like possibility that things were moving new into a new place, uh, for the country. And, you know, it was such a shock to the system for the people who believe that to see uh, Trump running and running successfully on saying, make America great again. I remember a lot of Democrats uh, talking in 2016 saying, you know, especially I would hear this from a lot of black Democrats. They would say, you know, when he says make America great again, it was never that great for people who Mm -hmm. look like me. Right. Uh, Mm -hmm. And uh, and that was a a real issue. But I think that there was a sense among and Holder is a friend of Obama's in addition to being his former attorney general and has spent a lot of time with him in his Uh, post-presidency. There is there was a sense that something was changing in America. And I think that what the, the the people who were attached to that idea missed was that 
not everything was changing in America. And also there were a lot of people who were not so excited about those changes. And Trump, uh, you see him playing into to all of these things, right? His election in 2016, Charlie, I don't tell you anything you don't uh, know mm-hmm. already here, but his election is a, a lot of different things that are coming together that, you know, the, all of these things that I'm talking about, anti-Clinton hate, uh, sexism, you know, the evangelicals who were concerned about the courts and what was going on with the Supreme Supreme Court or the Scalia seat, everything there, like it's all piled together. But you, each of these factors are like uh, a thousand paper cuts, right? That uh, that sink the Democrats' chances. Even though, as Trump would always say, the Electoral College would seem like it's uh, it's advantage Democrats. Uh, there's it at least is it puts Democrats in a, in a good position. And, and considering that they looked at Trump in 2016 and thought that he was the worst candidate for president ever. And at one point, the Clinton campaign was cheering the idea that he'd be mm-hmm. the nominee. Uh, you know, yeah. it, it looks a little different now. Well, we know how that uh, worked out. So when you sat down with with with, with Joe Biden, um, you know, after he won the White House, uh, he he described himself as the dog who caught the bus. <laughs> yeah. What, 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 okay. What did he mean by that? Well, so what happens? What? So I, I've covered Biden a long time for since he was vice president out on the campaign trail. We've had moments where he's been uh, more pleased with my reporting, and <laughs> moments where he's been less pleased with my reporting. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was one point in Iowa when uh, he got so mad at me for asking a lot of questions that he turned to me and he said, "All right, don't be a wise guy." Okay. Oh, uh, I remember <laughs> that. Yeah. Uh, I'd, for, I'd forgotten that you were the wise guy, though. Okay. I, I, I was that particular wise guy. That is a favorite expression of his. Uh, but at that moment, I was pushing him for why he changed his position on the Hyde Amendment. And yeah. he was at that point saying that it was a you know, long, deliberative process, but he'd done it in about 48 hours under political right. pressure. And I that remember. story is in the book, too, what actually mm-hmm. happened there. But uh, And I said to him, how did you have a long, thought-out process that happened so quickly? And that's when he got mad mm-hmm. enough that he said don't call uh, don't be a wise guy uh what happened with with the the the, the quote that you're referencing from the interview is that uh we start talking and there's like a little chit chat it's joe biden it's a you know again a reporter who's covered him for some time uh and i said to him so how are you uh feeling about this are you used to being in the oval office are you used to waking up upstairs and he said to me, well, you know, uh, Oval Office, I've been here a lot. I was here almost every day for eight years. So that's, yeah, that's no big deal. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's normal territory for me at this point. Waking up upstairs, you know, it's, uh, there are some days, again, he'd only been president for about two weeks. He says, there's some days where I, I go looking for my clothes. N- nobody ever told me that moving was going to be part of this, man. <laughs> you know, and it's a sort of joking way. I think people forget sometimes that Biden has this sense of humor humor that's a, a little mm-hmm. bit sarcastic and short. Um, and I gave it right back to him because I said to him, well, you know, you're the one who wanted this job. <laughs> and he said to me, yeah, you know, a friend of mine said to me that I am like the dog that caught a car. And I said mm-hmm. to him, no, I caught the bus. I'm the dog that caught the bus. And there was this real sense that, uh, and I think this is important, that that when he got into the race, uh, and the book traces how Charlottesville transformed mm-hmm. everything for him. But that's 2017. He doesn't get into the race until uh, the spring of 2019, officially. When he gets in, he's thinking Trump needs to go. He's really terrible. Charlottesville showed that this is not about politics, but about something deeper in America. And I can be the one to beat him. Um, and he saw his presidency as kind of a, a what, what the presidency that he would have in 2019 as like a reset moment for Democrats, for politics, for America, uh, almost like to, to look at Trump and say he's like a wound and I'm going to uh, let the wound close up a little bit. Uh, that That's how he went into it. And you go back to the speech that he gave at his kickoff in Philadelphia in uh, in May of 2019, and he says, you know, we want to do all these things to, to, you know, all these things that Democrats are talking about. I want to do them too, but none of it happens unless we beat Trump, and I'm th- that's what I'm here for. The pandemic, for, as it did for many things, changed everything for Biden, 
And he has this sense of his presidency now, and we'll see what he's able to do with it uh, as being transformative for America and also transformative for uh, for Democrats. He, he said to me at one point in the conversation, you know, I'm the most progressive person who's ever been president. And you know, you'd think about that as a brush back at Bernie Sanders. He's also talking a little bit about Obama there and saying to people, you know, I, I, for for all the the lefty Democrats who are still so in love with Obama, and he's saying like, "Look who's delivering on the things that progressives want." It's me. Uh, of course, let's see what happens with that, with this infrastructure uh, negotiation that's going on and all the other things that are going to happen. The American Rescue Plan has a lot in it that he wanted and a lot in it that progressives wanted. Of course, got. Uh, no Republican votes in Congress, but has a lot of support out in the country among Republicans. Uh, if they can get that model to work over and over again uh, in the next couple months and uh, into the midterms next year, then they're in probably better shape than they have any rights to be as just the historical trends of what happens with the party. So was there a shift in his thinking from imagining a, a Biden presidency as being transitional? to being transformative because early on it did sound like he was more focused on that that i'm kind of a bridge person uh, i'm a bridge to the next generation uh we just need to get rid of trump as you just explained but but clearly now um he's he has embraced the idea that he will be a transformational president so was that always the plan did he change his mind um, no, he, he uh, changes his mind. There, there, there's a moment and it, like, he changes his mind with the circumstances. I think he met a moment that he, of course, couldn't have anticipated in the campaign, but now thinks that he's meeting a moment <laughs> that he couldn't have anticipated as president. You go back to there's a scene in the book that's what uh, was the last rally of the Biden campaign that wasn't a drive in rally. And I was there. It was in Detroit on March 9th. Uh, and I, it's the rally where he gets endorsed by. Uh, importantly, Kamala Harris and Cory Booker and Gretchen Whitmer there in, in Michigan. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what was weird about that rally is I actually wasn't supposed to be on the road that day. Um, it was a couple days after Super Tuesday. We thought it'd be a long, drawn out process mm -hmm. between him and Sanders. And that morning I emailed my editor and I said, you know, this coronavirus thing seems like it could shut stuff down for two weeks. I should just go fill my notebook up two with weeks. new voices um, from voters so that we can draw on it over the two weeks when there's not going to be anything going on. Um, this is why I don't make predictions publicly, Charlie. Um, and that rally, uh, and I, I tweeted a video because I thought it was so crazy of as everybody walked in, they were, it was in a high school and they were saying, um, Hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer, squirting in it. Like, what is this? Hand sanitizer? Yeah. Uh, and I walked around and talked to people there. And some of these comments are in the book of people saying like, oh, yeah, I'm not really that concerned about this. Or, it's fine, whatever. Um, so that's March 9th. March 10th is when the campaigns got shut down. Uh, Biden was supposed to be in, uh, in Cleveland. And Sanders also was supposed to be in Cleveland that night. They were going to do competing rallies. They canceled it uh, at the last minute within about two minutes of each other because Mike DeWine said to them, you know, who was out ahead on all this stuff, he said, don't do <clears> these <throat> rallies. Uh, but at that rally, Biden says, I'm the bridge to the next generation. That's, yeah, that's how to think that. of me, right? right. And, and as I point out in the book, like what he's kind of saying there is like, hey, maybe think of me like, you know, Lyndon Johnson, right? You wouldn't have thought Lyndon Johnson was great on civil rights if you go back to <laughs> who he was growing up. Uh, but... Uh, th that worked out. So like maybe like squint hard and you can maybe see this working. Uh, but then, uh, who, who's the, the president that he decides to hang the portrait of over the fireplace in the Oval Office? It's, it's Franklin Roosevelt, right? And, he, and, and I, I don't know who he might have put in that spot. Uh, otherwise, but I feel like it might have been more like a Harry Truman, someone who's sort of continuing the legacy. Now he really thinks of himself as that guy. We're going to find out what it looks like. Well, what also c comes through in this book, though, was really how non-inevitable his his nomination was. Here's the review from from The Guardian that describes the, the Democratic Party this way. The party of Jackson, FDR, and JFK is now an upstairs-downstairs coalition of coastal elites and minorities hounded by politically self-destructive demands for defunding the police and ever greater wokeness. 
And yet somehow they end up with Joe Biden. So let's just talk about that because, you know, it, it did feel that there was there was a moment in this in this campaign when it, it, he was dead. I mean, he was, he, you know, more than dead. Prime. Yeah, more, more than dead. <laughs> about, I mean, the, the low spot. He finished fifth in New Hampshire. Yeah. And, and 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 yet somehow came back and defined because I'm, I remember 10 days before 10, 11 days before Super Tuesday, um, we ran a piece in the bulwark basically saying, you know, we're less than two weeks away from Bernie Sanders taking over the Democratic Party and what well, we know what happened. So so talk about that. I, rem- how, I remember how, that piece. <laughs> how does how does a guy like Joe Biden win so decisively in a party that clearly has a different id? I mean, you know, let's you know the, the 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 Elizabeth Warren Bernie Sanders wing seems to be where the heart, the beating heart of the party is, and yet they imploded. Yeah, well, I think a couple of things were going on with that. First of all, it wasn't just uh, the readers of the Bulwark who were worried about Bernie Sanders being the nominee, right? I, I think that uh, that. In a situation where Biden had been up against some other candidate who wasn't so distasteful to a lot of Democrats, Bernie Sanders has a lot of supporters, but has a lot of people who really don't like him either, um, and uh, and 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 also were worried that he would lose to Trump. And those two things combined helped give Biden a boost. But uh, there was also a divide, uh, and this is a big part of what I trace in the book. And you look at what happened with Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. This race probably would have gone differently if only one of them had gotten in, mm-hmm. right? With both of them there, uh, it changed how the support was. And I think this is, you know, if you track this back against the 2016 primary uh, for the Republicans, one of the things that was to Trump's advantage is that he was occupying a space that was basically his own, where all, while all the other candidates competed to uh, see who could be the one to oppose him. And it didn't work out for any of them, right? Um, because they could never consolidate that support. And the Democratic side, what happened was that Sanders and Warren are, are splitting some of that progressive support, uh, going to some other candidates too. Pete Buttigieg got a little bit of it uh, mm-hmm. among Warren voters. Uh, and and that weakens that part of the party. Then, uh, again, when it gets to the time where it looks like after Sanders comes very close to winning in Iowa, wins in New Hampshire, wins in Nevada, mm-hmm. uh, and he's heading into – remember, that process happens really quickly. It's Super Tuesday uh, was three days after the South Carolina primary. So it's Saturday to Tuesday is that whole period. And that's the chapter in the book. It's called 72 Hours That Changed History because they yeah. did. Because what happens is there's such a move. Biden gets so much uh, of the vote in South Carolina because of uh, his connection with black voters, because of Jim Clyburn's endorsement, because he'd spent a lot of time there. And the other candidates largely drop out. The feeling in the party is like, whoa, 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 let's not have Bernie Sanders here. Uh, And all those things come together so that on Super Tuesday, (laughs) there's a story in the book where Biden is in uh, Los Angeles uh, because California was voting on the Super Tuesday, too. And they don't think that they're going to have such a big night. They're at a chicken and waffles uh, restaurant shaking hands. Again, it's right before Mm -hmm. coronavirus hits. Uh, And suddenly they get the results uh, at 4 p.m. Pacific time, but it's 7 p.m. Eastern time from Massachusetts. As soon as the polls close, basically, they know that Biden won Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren's home state, right? And then they have him set up for this small event at a community center in L.A. that ends up being the speech when he's essentially claiming the Democratic nomination. And they weren't prepared for any of it. And it's, it's not because the Biden campaign in those couple of weeks suddenly changed everything. It was working so much better than it had been well and you also describe these personalities um i i, I think really effectively and, and, you know you talk about you know sanders and warren and, and and how that that rift between the two of them was inevitable they may have had a a strategic alliance but they were never these these people were not gregarious um they you describe them both as kind of awkward introverts which obviously yeah. affected their ability to uh, uh you know to 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 move on um talk to me a little bit about uh you know sanders really tried to shape the election the, the the campaign and and looked like he had succeeded by pushing the uh, the medicare for all and he got everybody to essentially sign up for all of that and at least some democrats were convincing themselves that medicare for all was somehow going to be their magic bullet um and yet 
you know, it it, it 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 was not quite as potent as many of them imagined. So, talk to me about Bernie Sanders and what happened with Medicare for all, and 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 why people like uh, you know, Kamala Harris and and Warren came to regret uh, signing on to Bernie's plan. Well. Medicare for all is something that Bernie Sanders believes in. I think we should just start by saying that, right? He he thinks it's the right idea. He is very much uh, not in the majority opinion of at least people in Congress about that um, and Democratic leaders about that. They think, and that goes for progressives to moderates among uh, Democrats. Uh, there, there's a lot of skepticism uh, for how it would actually work or whether it could work, and uh, and so he pushes the bill because he. He thinks that, OK, like I, I believe in it, but there's also a political agenda going on here, which is that he thinks starting in 2017, hey, I might run for president again. There's a decent shot of it. And what this could do is force Democrats to sign on to my idea so that they can't be attacking me if we're running against each other in the primary. And even if they say I'm for Medicare for all, too, as somewhat famously, Elizabeth Warren did, but all of them eventually did, except for Joe Biden, mm -hmm. excuse me, and, and Pete Buttigieg among the, the leading candidates, uh, that, that they would not be as pure about it as Bernie Sanders was. And this is, I think, again, where you see uh, some of the the uh, parallels, and they're, they're imperfect parallels, but the parallels between what Sanders does and, and the way Trump does it, right? Where you just, either you're fully there with him or you're not there at all. Uh, and that it, 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 I don't know, Charlie, whether you subjected yourself to all those Democratic primary debates, but I well, was there for some. all of them. <laughs> <laughs> I was there for all of them. I watched every minute of them. Uh, the first uh, almost I, I think of, of every debate, if not uh, maybe it was almost every debate. The first like 40 minutes were candidates back and forth talking about how they would make Medicare for all happen or what their d differences were. No, it's it's a crazy thing. Medicare for all was never going to pass. And yet mm -hmm. it became this uh, beyond like a litmus test. It became the defining issue for Democrats in a way that I think really could have hurt them a lot and could have put Democrats, uh, again, in a non-pandemic normal campaign into a, a much weaker position, uh, even had it still ended with Biden being the nominee, because there's not a huge amount of support for government takeover of health care. And in fact, there's some polling data in the book that Pete Buttigieg's campaign did, and they asked Democratic voters, do you support Medicare for all? And among the ones who said yes, said, well, what do you think that means? <laughs> and what they think it means, most of them, is the public option, not government run healthcare completely. And, uh, you know, there are more popular ideas that Democrats potentially could have run on, ones that would have broken through theoretically to, uh, to moderate voters, to Republicans, to independents. Uh, one of them that uh, Elizabeth Warren's campaign wishes it had all been about is her idea of a wealth tax. Uh, that's not necessarily the way to go um, or not necessarily the uh, the most politically potent idea. But there, the Warren folks argument about that is uh, that appeals to a lot more people to say, hey, super rich people should just have to pay two cents on every everything over $50 million. Uh, and uh, rather than saying to everybody, the government's going to take over all your health care. Uh, and you see this struggle uh, among all of the Democrats, again, except basically for Biden, to say they support Medicare for all and then say like, well, actually, when I said that, I didn't really mean it. Kamala Harris, as you pointed out, uh, leapt on supporting Medicare for all in 2017 because she thought, hey, Bernie's not going to run. I'll prove my progressive uh, bona fides. Uh, and then when she is running against Sanders, is just squirming to explain how actually she doesn't support government run health care. Well, I, I have two, two more questions I want to address about uh, Biden now and that he is president and the challenges that he faces. So how genuinely surprised do you think he is by his inability to reach compromises with, with Democrats? I think oh, he sorry, is with less. Republicans? Yeah. Um, I think he is less surprised than – some people might make him out to be, right? He does definitely think of himself as like the deal maker, the guy who's in the Senate for 40 years. Hey, I even talked to Mitch McConnell and made deals when Obama was president. That's all true, but he also was there uh, for the deal making that didn't happen during the Obama presidency. 
And more than that, he saw what happened during the campaign and uh, when uh, the, uh, the when Trump targeted his family and what led to the first impeachment and all the questions about Hunter Biden. And of course, that hit Biden very hard it's coming after his son. Uh, and he felt like Republicans should have stood up for it and they didn't. Uh, and and they should have said something, uh, it, at least publicly have condemned Trump more than they did, uh, if not voted uh, for an impeachment, even though he himself didn't think that removing the president over, was a, a great idea. And you see him struggling over the that as a political decision and knowing and being kind of pushed by the party and by the political dynamics to support impeachment, even though he really didn't want to. Uh, and, but then it builds up to what happened with the riot in January. And uh, and so he looks at that and, and that and, and the, the members of Congress who voted to uh, overturn the election results even that night. He's not an idiot, right? <laughs> um, yeah. He didn't think that this was going to be an easy time. Uh, and the frustration you see coming out of him even this week where he's talking about uh, Joe Manchin and Kristen Cinema yeah. and his own party, right? Uh, he wants to get a lot done. Like I was saying, he has this big idea of his presidency. Uh, and he thinks – I think that the key thing that he's going for – is this idea that he and top aides have talked about, which is that uh, bipartisan to him doesn't mean getting Republican votes in Congress necessarily, but means getting support uh, for his ideas among uh, Democrats and Republicans out in the country. And you look at the polling about the American Rescue Plan, the COVID relief plan that they passed uh, earlier this year. It got no Republican votes in the House, no Republican votes in the Senate. And yet you see approval in the 60s uh, among Republicans yeah. for that plan. And that's what they're hoping to do. So how durable is his alliance with the progressive wing of the party? I mean, so far they have stuck with him. He has not lost any votes. There's been a little bit of grumbling, uh, but it's really been extraordinary. The, the his success in holding together, um, you know, he may have failed getting Republican support, but but um, given the small margins for the Democrats, they've done a pretty good job of holding people together. But are there some challenges, some bumps coming along the road? Because this is clearly not a party that is completely unified on issues of policy. Uh, so give me your sense of how that's going to play out. D does it limit his ability to compromise on the infrastructure bill? Uh, might there be issues where the progressive left is going to say, you've let us down, we're disappointed with you, or you're, you're not going along with us as zealously as we want you to? Yeah, definitely there will be. Uh, it's funny, I'm, I'm working on a piece right now uh, about Pete Buttigieg that will publish in The Atlantic in the next couple of days. Uh, one of the people I spoke to is Rodney Davis, the congressman from Illinois. And, he, you know, he's a moderate, um, wants to work on some kind of infrastructure compromise. And I said to him, you know, Buttigieg keeps doing like late night shows and all these things. Like, does that move any Republican votes uh, for infrastructure? And he said, no, I think, and this is Davis's theory about what Buttigieg is doing, he said, I think that that's probably more about trying to, get the progressives in the Democratic Party ready for uh, some of the disappointment that they're going to feel over what this deal finally looks like. Uh, and, so, you know, that that's one of the aspects of this. Progressives are going to be disappointed uh, with, with some of what happens, if not with a lot of what happens. But I, I think that this is one of these uh, points where, again, you see imperfect parallels between the Republicans and the Democrats of what's going on here, because the Democrats can't figure out exactly what to do about repeating the Biden coalition, right? And in the same way, Republicans, I think, can't figure out what do you do about repeating the Trump coalition without Trump, uh, even if that was not a winning uh, coalition in, in uh, November, it was the second most votes that anybody had ever gotten in history. There's a story toward the end of the book about a protest that happened uh, outside the DNC headquarters a couple of weeks after the election. And it was in favor of the Green New Deal, which, again, it, like Medicare for All, is something very popular with uh, the the left wing of the party, but not uh, all that popular with uh, a lot of other folks, including, by the way, like Nancy Pelosi. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
Uh, and, and the people who attend that protest are uh, three of the four members of the, the, the squad. Uh, Ayanna Presley wasn't there. And a couple of newer uh, members who had similarly won primaries from the left. And one of the, the speakers is Ilhan Omar from Minnesota. Uh, and she starts speaking. She says, you know, I had the highest turnout in my district of any House member in the country. And my <laughs> colleagues keep coming to me and they keep saying, Ilhan, how did you do it? Ilhan, how do we make it happen here for our voters? And I say to them, you have to give to them something that they believe in. If you give them something to believe in, they'll turn out, they'll respond to it. Okay, so Charlie, it's important to like think about what was happening there. Because that district is not only in a state that was theoretically going to be a swing state, it's in Minnesota, right? It wasn't mm-hmm. that swingy in the end. But it's the district that George Floyd was killed in, right? So a pretty important uh, epicenter for a lot of what was happening in this election. That district, she's right, had the highest turnout in the country. There's another important number about it, though. That district had the highest drop off from votes for the Democratic candidate for president, for Joe Biden, and votes for a Democratic member of the House. So she is right, even though she had a pretty good turnout operation of her own. She's right that people felt like there was something to believe in, but they seem to be believing in Joe Biden. And that is true, not in that district only, it's most starkly true there, but all across the country, you see that Biden ran ahead of almost every Democrat for Senate, for House. He got more votes. Some of that is because people just vote for president more and some of it was anti-Trump voting. But that's an issue that is fundamental for the Democrats trying to figure out what they're going to be going forward here. Because Biden's brand himself, the way that he connected with people as a politician and as a person, is clearly a better brand than the Democrats' brand is. So, look, looking ahead, um, you know, I, 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 th- I think there, are, even though his his approval numbers are strong, I, I think there's some real challenges. Inflation's a challenge. Rising crime is a challenge. Getting the border uh, handled. The uh, possibility of of gridlock. Um, what do you see as the major challenges over the next year and a half for, for Joe Biden? Or, or what does what do you think the Biden White House sees as as the biggest threats? So the biggest threat is the pandemic and whether there will be a spike in infections or variants um, and what that might do to the economy and reopening schools, right? And a lot of that's out of their hands, even though they've been pushing as hard as they can on vaccines and uh, and, and getting everybody uh, to think about July 4th as this uh, moment to observe the change. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the, the, this is – there are two sets of focus groups that I looked at uh, in the book of uh, Obama-Trump voters, right? Those people who voted for Obama in 08 and in 12 and for Trump in 16. One is done – uh, right after Trump wins in 16. And uh, and it's commissioned by Obama, basically, by Obama's aides. And they bring the results to him. And what they see is that, and then they go to Iowa. Iowa is a very special place to Obama and uh, also home to the most counties that flipped from Obama to Trump in the country in 16. And what they say, basically, is that they liked Obama because they thought he was going to come in and change things. And the reason why they went to Trump is because that he tried to change things and he got stopped. And so they need somebody else to come in and change things in a much more mm. uh, violent way, essentially. Mm-hmm. That's what they like. They bring that data back to Obama. And I've got this scene where they, they show it to him and he, he looks at it and he says, yeah, I get it. That's Obama, right? And that's mm-hmm. the beginning of his process of trying to figure out how to act and how to think about the Democratic, uh, what's going on in the Democratic Party during the Trump presidency, to come back to what we were talking about earlier. The second set of focus groups uh, is, again, Obama-Trump voters, but it's right before the election last year. And these are not just Obama-Trump voters, but they're people who are deciding between Trump and Biden. And the basic read that happens in those focus groups is they look at Trump and they say, I don't like him, but I do think that he can improve the economy when uh, we come out of the pandemic. Uh, But I don't think he can get us out of the pandemic. And they look at Biden and they say, he's a good man. I don't think he knows what's going on with the economy. I'm not sure what to do about that or what to make of what's going on in the left of the party with stuff like defund the police. It kind of freaks me out. But he seems like he can get us out of the pandemic, and that's priority number one. 
Hmm. So you put that that together, right? And you think to answer your question, right? Uh, now of, of what it is that he needs to do, he needs to show results, and he keep. That's why he keeps, keeps talking about this. He needs people to feel like there is an effect of the uh, of his presidency in their lives. And if he doesn't, that's bad news for Democrats. It's probably bad news for uh, him if he runs in 2024 or whoever it'll be. Uh, it's bad news uh, for people's faith in government, and that goes across the board, right? All the progressives who are uh, more enthusiastic about him than they expect it to be now. Uh, if, if they don't feel like things are happening, then they're going to not turn out next year uh, and not turn out maybe again in 2024. Uh, the Republicans outside of Washington who are supportive of the agenda, who feel like, hey, we got our stimulus checks. Hey, we're seeing the jobs numbers go up. Hey, we're you know, all these things that they can start to see things getting better, at least on the pandemic, whether or not that's the uh, <laughs> you can attribute that to Operation Warp Speed or what the, the Biden folks have been doing. But. Uh, all of that stuff, they need to keep feeling it in their lives. They need to keep feeling like government is doing anything. Otherwise, they'll turn against him, too. And they'll turn against Democrats, too. And it's it's just – it's some of it's in their hands and some of it's not. Some of it's not. So uh, you, you've spent a lot of time with, with, with Joe Biden during the campaign. Uh, you talked to him after he was elected. You know what the line is, the Fox News line, that, uh, that, that he is – you know, that he's cognitively impaired, that he's just a figurehead, that the left is really running the administration. So give me your sense. I mean, obviously, he's – lost a few steps, right? I mean, he doesn't have the fastball he used to have, but what is your sense of where, you know, I mean, how, how is, how is Biden? I guess I'm asking, how, how is he? <laughs> Uh, yeah, he. There are things about him where he's sometimes searching for a word for a little bit longer, I and mean, some of it's he's showing his age. He's seventy eight yeah. years old, right? Uh, but I, uh, first of all, uh, there's a he, he has a stutter that has gotten a little bit more prominent again as he's gotten older, and that's one of the things that people have leapt on. Um, um, I haven't seen him. I wouldn't call what I've seen cognitive decline. I saw him being very rusty out on the stump. Um, and I don't know, uh, Charlie, you, you, you're good in front of a mic. I'm, I'm a print reporter. Um, uh, I wouldn't want to be in a position of having a campaign constantly, no. but Biden, Biden was very good at it. Um, and he got a little, uh, worse at it and then sometimes a lot worse at it and sometimes the speeches in Iowa or New Hampshire were just you know he feeds off a crowd the crowds were old and small and it was it was bad some of them were really bad what I will say is that in speaking to him uh, the conversation that I had with him that uh, ends the book was on uh, February 2nd so it's already uh, maybe I'm a little out of date and <laughs> having conversations with him but at least for then what I picked up was and it surprised me and i've heard this from other people who've spoken to him there's a confidence that he has in himself hmm. that wasn't there in the same way and it was a sort of <laughs> I, you remember trump's line was like well i'm president and you're not or, right. right like and um and he felt like i i don't know it seems like that does something to be elected president be sworn as president to uh, to go back to what i was saying to wake up in the white house every day that, uh, that gives well, you a feeling think, about yourself right i mean that, 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 that makes sense i mean that would be a life-affirming thing to be elected president of the united states so that's that's yeah. sort of plausible and, <laughs> and, and i think especially life-affirming when it's been your dream for 50 years right um so he's been dreaming of being president for admittedly longer than i've been alive <laughs> um and knowing that so many people said it couldn't work it wouldn't work and that i uh, that, that you know when he looks at me he says i'm the one who believed that i could do it and i was yeah. right and, and now bad. i'm here and so i think more than uh th than decline at this point that's what i'm seeing i will say there have been a couple of moments where you see the the old biden slipping in and the one that struck me the most was uh the afternoon when we were waiting for the Derek chauvin verdict and mm -hmm. he said I, I i don't remember the exact words but he said i hope it goes the right way or something like that mm -hmm. and that is the looseness and the um, saying something dumb that got him in trouble as, uh, you know, makes sense too, because he was weighing in on a verdict before it happened. Um, even though it had, I guess been, the verdict had been decided at that point. We're just waiting for the jury to get back. Um, 
And that you haven't seen in part because the White House is very studiously keeping him from speaking a lot and from yeah. having too many of those moments. Well, you and, could, and, and, the conspiracies could argue that that's on purpose, though. Well, I mean, I mean, those, those kinds of gaffes go back uh, decades, not necessarily cognitive decline. I mean, that, he's been he's been a verbal train wreck for a very, very long time. So I'm not sure that that that's a sign that he's actually losing anything. Um, the book is Battle for the Soul Inside the Democrats Campaign to Defeat Trump by Isaac Dover. It is outstanding. Strongly recommend. I think it is probably uh, the, the the best read of the cam- of the 2020 campaign, and you know I, I think your the success of the book is that it's it it doesn't get bogged down in kind of the horse race electoral math type thing, but it talks about the personalities and how the personalities drove what happened and re- really a rather extraordinarily um, unpredictable campaign as as it turned out. Uh, Isaac Dover, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it very much. Charlie, thanks very much for having me. This was great. And thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we will do this all over again.